All right. Uh, thank you so much again for the, all the presenters. Um, that was a really great conversation. I found myself just sitting here nodding and kind of like snapping like, yes, absolutely. Uh, lots of really, really great points. Um, so we're going to be shifting gears right now, um, and we're going to be uh, seeing our presentations from community scientists, local artists, um, researchers, and all of the above. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Gillen uh, for the Oysters uh, New York City Unlikely Saviors presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Gillen and I'm a graduate student at NYU. I'm currently getting my master's in documentary journalism and my final project last semester had to be climate change related and relevant to New York City. I chose to produce a four minute documentary film on how oysters are reviving New York City's coastline one oyster at a time. I will now screen that video for you all and I hope you enjoy. I had a lot of fun filming and traveling around the city following the oysters. All right, sharing my screen now. Can everyone see it? Looks good. All right, here we go. Can you raise the volume? You gotta unmute yourself. Nicole, you gotta unmute yourself so we can listen. Sorry, Nicole, I'm not sure if I can hear, but if you un or stop sharing and then reshare with sound, uh, we can hear the, the audio with it. Okay, oops, let's share, no worries. Share, okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh. <laughs> this seafood dish is not only super popular, but is helping restore New York City's water and coastline. Oysters. Can you eat New York City oysters? Absolutely not. So you cannot eat New York City oysters. Um, New York City water, though it is getting cleaner, is not good. Don't worry. The oysters we consumed came from certified waterways, not the New York Harbor. You wouldn't want to eat anything that comes from the water. It has been polluted for decades thanks to years of industrialization, sewage, and waste dumping. According to the EPA, over 1.3 million pounds of PCBs were dumped into the Hudson, making not only the water extremely hazardous to humans, but completely wiping out all wildlife. Today, oysters are more than just food, but a fantastic filtration system for the water. So an oyster is a bivalve, and what that means is that it has two valves, or, and it has two shells, and it has a fleshy body inside. So when you open it up, you'll see all of its you know, anatomy inside. So an oyster is always going to be closed when it's alive, and it is um, a filter feeder. And so what that means is that it's taking suspended solids that are in the water and bringing it into its body. And they have this very cool structure called the labial palps. Uh, which is essentially like a tongue, if you'd imagine. And it has the ability to separate components that it wants to eat from components it doesn't want to eat. Although oysters were harvested to extinction, organizations like the Billion Oyster Project are at the forefront of restoration efforts. They vow to restore one billion oysters back to the New York Harbor by 2035. So far, they farmed over 75 million oysters by growing them in specialized labs and planting reefs around New York City. That bucket on your way, that would be great. Holy crap. Okay. <laughs> you good? They also conduct regular outreach events with the public to get volunteers educated and involved in helping reef installations and oyster cage upkeep. Currently, one of the Billion Oyster Project's biggest plans to fight coastline erosion is called the Living Breakwaters. This is in collaboration with the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery and the SCAPE design team. Located on the south end of Staten Island, the Living Breakwaters is a climate adaptive green infrastructure that began being built in August of this year. This installation will have a designated section for oysters to help break up wave impact and filter the water. When we got this project to implement, it was the SCAPE team who kind of who proposed this project. One of the ideas was 
you know, not just to try to break break the waves and attenuate the waves during a, a storm and um, accounting for sea level rise, reversing coastal erosion. Uh, but this idea of trying to return the oysters uh, to this particular area to achieve water filtration. Uh, and then also when you have oysters in like these reef bridges and stuff that we're building, it encourages other marine habitat as well. We're really trying to like bring it back to how it was, um, you know, probably 35 plus years ago. But that's why we call this project it's Living Breakwaters. What makes this unique is like the materials that we're using and the, the connection to the marine habitat um, and how that also interacts with um, you know, our, our world, our climate. Next time you're eating oysters, make sure to thank them for saving the planet one oyster at a time. All right, that is the end of my video, thanks. Thank you so much, Nicole, that was great. Um, all right, next we have Tishevi Acosta, uh, the detection and quantification of pharmaceuticals and drug abuse in New York City waterways. Tishevi, you can take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Tishavia Costa. I work at CUNY John Jay College in the Forensic Toxicology Lab, and we have been monitoring the pharmaceuticals and drugs of abuse in the waterways for the last two years. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity to share this research with you. So the use of illicit and um, licit drugs has been increasing in our society over the past few years. Uh, this chart shows the overdose, um, national drug overdose deaths by gender from 1999 to 2018. And we can see, we can see here, the numbers are pretty um, shocking. And we can actually see these numbers increasing in our water as well. So the increase in the the increase in these uh, contaminants in the water can can come from um, contaminants coming from both surface and groundwater. This can be extremely harmful to aquatic life, um, as pharmaceuticals can affect their uh, essential ecosystem, and um, you know such as photosynthesis and nutrient cycling. It can also cause behavioral changes um, for for uh, you know the wildlife, especially when we're concerning about the fish. Oops. In the past, um, research has been done on the Upper Hudson region um, in terms of looking at pharmaceuticals, but nothing has been done in the waterways of the East River or the Lower Hudson. So our objective for our study was to validate an analytical method for 28 different drugs, including amphetamines, uh, opiates, cannabis, and different prescription me medications. Uh, we wanted to quantify these drugs from the last collection season over the summer of 2021. These were the drugs that we targeted. As you can see, there's many of the common, most commonly prescribed pharmaceuticals, as well as the most common drugs of abuse. And we utilize an internal standard in order to, to uh, quantify these compounds. So sample pretreatment. So over the last season, we because of COVID restrictions, we were freezing the samples upon collection and we an analyzed them uh, during the fall semester. So we had to defrost the samples the day before, and then samples were aliquoted, 50 mil aliquots were used for analysis. We did something called solid phase extraction. And the funny thing is that because we had basic most of our compounds were basic in nature, but we had, we really wanted to target the carboxy THC, mostly also because uh, we knew that marijuana was on the legalization path. We wanted to make sure that we included that. Um, we had to divide this extraction into two. So we had our first elution collected just for all basic drugs, and then the second for the cannabinoids. We utilized LC uh, tandem MS to analyze to both identify and quant all of our compounds. The total ion chromatogram that you see on the screen shows 27 of the analytes 
I didn't include the THC, it's just a single peak, but you can see that we were able to successfully develop and validate this method for all of the drugs. So here's the interesting part of the study. So we analyzed 215 different samples in the summer of 2021, and we had 196 positive samples for metropolol. Metropolol is used for the, um, the high blood pressure from um, regulating, sorry, that was the word, regulating blood pressure. Um, another shocking thing was that 142 positive cases for the metabolite of cocaine, and then we see actual positive cases of cocaine. You expect to see more of the metabolite for cocaine because it's very easily hydrolyzed to its metabolite, which is BE. But to see actual cocaine in the water was very, very alarming. Uh, we also saw, as we suspected, uh, um, 22 different positive cases for fent norfentanil, which is the major metabolite of fentanyl. And I don't know if um, you guys are up to date with what's going on with pharmaceuticals and fentanyl. We have, there is a huge fentanyl crisis happening right now um, where there's a lot of driving under the influence cases with very, very high levels of fentanyl. So seeing it in the water was, was alarming. Um, I made this uh, pie chart to kind of show, we can see the highest number of um, high percentage of the drugs that we found were the uh, blood pressure medications, the metropolol and the tetanol, but then seeing the drugs of abuse, seeing the EDDP, which is a, a methadone metabolite, methadone is used to treat opioid addiction, and seeing the methamphetamine, BE, and cocaine is, you know, very shocking. So I'm very um, looking forward to this season to see what we are able to find. So here, um, I, oh, Thank you so much. Tisha. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no worries. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of your research and we're super excited to continue, uh, you know, collecting samples every Thursday. Uh, so I'll see you at the lab. I'm very thankful for you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, we have um, Altura Ruins by Brooke Bowden. All right. Awesome. I'm sharing it. All right, you guys can see my, my screen? Looking good. Awesome. Uh, yes, I am uh, recently graduated a Master of Architecture student from Pratt Institute, and this was a project from last fall uh, named Ulterior Ruins, located in the Bush Terminal uh, in the community's uh, Sunset Park. I'll just get right into it. Uh, located in the community of Sunset Park, Ulterior Ruins is a regeneration of a former coal power plant that sits at a forgotten and secluded corner along the East River, which this urban spelunking community considers a crown jewel among New York City's many offerings. The immediate surroundings have been, as Millie Radic would say, subjected to the tradition of neglect and shrouded in lack. Yet the current ruins express that a story took place. Both the history and the future of the building are uncertain as nature continues to reclaim the building and site. New contexts must be made to ensure the past is respected and new histories are made. Ulterior Ruins creates an archaeological archive and an ecological generator along a proposed green corridor, reconnecting the site with the community of Sunset Park and creating a destination for the public and private sectors alike. A new riprap barrier serves as oyster beds and protects the site against rising seawaters, creates new ecosystems, and circulates people through the building at the ground level. The section reveals the program, that of gallery spaces, not meant just for fine art, but for endangered ecosystems. The archive volumes are embedded in pools of oyster and algae production. At moments, sculptures are moved into the pools themselves, allowing for the algae and oysters to grow onto them. At this moment, the typical hierarchy between humans' artistic and engineering pursuits is broken, and a new hierarchy or heterarchy is created between arcology and ecology, which the Anthropocene age implies. The algae and oyster cultivation relies on a six level raceway following the gallery circulation, in which gravity slowly moves the water between the gallery spaces. An Archimedes screw then returns the water to the top level, allowing for 
allowing for continued circulation, promoting oyster growth, and water filtration. Light cannons starting at the roof weave through the gallery spaces downward to prov provide the light necessary for the algae's growth and create powerful moments of light and shadow for the artwork to play off of. In addition to the ecological and cultural production, Ulterior Ruins serves as a new home for climate justice groups such as Uproads. This new space will allow for greater organizational operations, which will be necessary to achieve climate equality. Meeting spaces, classrooms, and an amphitheater would offer a space that reflects a possible version of climate equality in which uh, the community can meet and discuss issues and actions, allowing for greater influence within New York City's political sphere. And possibly reaching beyond that in New York, such as being a possible venue for the climate conferences, such as the climate or conference of the parties. The concept of time in relation to the climate crisis is precious and it's becoming increasingly so with every new report. By constructing the appearance of abandonment or ruins, it is reflecting that if action is not taken, buildings and more will fall to decay. But there is possible more holistic solution when we consider how environmental production can coexist with leisure activities and the conservation of our built industrial past can be recontextualized in order to address and offset the damage that they have caused to the local ecosystems and their contribution to our current crisis. Ulterior ruins places art that is stuck in the time of its creation in a forgotten space with endangered ecosystems reminding the visitor of time again. This serves as an archeological archive, not only as art serves as artifacts of human history, but also humans impact on every aspect of, eco of ecology along with the history of the building. Worker circulation cuts through gallery spaces above the visitors' head, heads, and the gallery spaces in circulation plunge into the pools of oyster, algae, and art. The user is submersed into this uh, new, possibly uncomfortable, but necessary hierarchy. And ultimately, a symbiotic relationship is formed between the cultural and ecological production, resulting in the promotion of societal engagement with water culture, building, and ecosystem conservation while giving a larger platform for the voice of communities that are most affected by the climate crisis. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, I loved seeing this presentation uh, in Pratt a couple of months back. Um, it's a really great opportunity to take an older building and come up with new designs uh, for what it could be. And it, this project did blow me away. So thank you so much, Brooke, for coming yes. today. You bet, thank you. So next up, we have um, Oyster Base Camp Program in San Francisco Bay, presentation by Kay uh, Casey Harper. Hello, um, let me get my screen here. Uh, just gonna shift coasts for a minute and talk about California for a second. Um, all right, so hello. Uh, my name is Casey. I'm the deputy director of the Wild Oyster Project, which is a nonprofit dedicated to restoring our native Olympia oyster to San Francisco Bay. And I'm going to be talking about our Oyster Base Camp program. So we are greatly inspired by the work that Billion Oyster Project is doing. And our mission is oyster restoration driven by our community. We are especially focused on areas around the Bay that have a disproportionate pollution burden and are most vulnerable to future sea level rise. Our work is in San Francisco Bay, which is the largest estuary on the West Coast and is the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ohlone and Coast Miwok, who have cultivated Olympia oysters for thousands of years. So what is an Olympia oyster? It's the native oyster of the West Coast. It's a lot smaller than the Eastern oyster and it grows a lot more slowly as well. Uh, it's currently estimated to be about 1% uh, of historic levels. And just like New York's Eastern oyster, they provide key ecosystem services that merit large scale restoration efforts. So there are still wild oysters in San Francisco Bay, but their populations are pretty small and fragmented. And they are basically just surviving by growing on whatever they can find. That is not the soft mud that now covers most of the bay. Um, and just like with Eastern oysters, Olympia oyster larvae are free swimming in the water column and they are actively seeking out other oysters on which to settle and to grow. So, inspired by the Billion Oyster Project's oyster research stations, 
uh, we started a volunteer oyster gardening program here in the Bay. And especially during the outbreak of COVID, it felt like something we could do with our volunteers safely. And as far as we know, it's the first volunteer oyster gardening program uh, in San Francisco Bay. Um, so what is an oyster-based camp? It's basically just a cage that we can submerge in salty water and that holds our recycled oyster shell. Uh, all of the shell that we use has been collected over the past three to four years by our volunteers from restaurants um, around San Francisco Bay. And it's been cured for two years and then we add it to a base camp and put it in the water. Um, it stays suspended in the water column. It's attached to a dock by a line. So it's not disturbing the existing benthic environment and it helps keep it a little safer from potential oyster predators. Um, so where we are right now in our program, last summer we put in our first prototype. Uh, since then we've had a round of volunteer training for our oyster-based camp hosts and monitors that was done online via Zoom. Um, and then we deployed four more uh, base camps for a total of five. And this summer, we're gonna be collecting data for the first round of monitoring for those base camps and also collecting feedback from our hosts on how they are you know, feeling about the program. So data collection is every six months. We collect water quality data at the site in addition to oyster recruitment data. And we are also using iNaturalist to upload what other organisms we happen to find in the base camp um, as part of our species richness data. Um, so for this program, we partnered with an app called Smart Oysters that was originally designed for oyster farmers. And with them, we created a specific form of the app for our own use for our data collection. So through this app, we can schedule monitoring events for each location. We know when and where the data collection is happening. We can modify the fields and the text. So the app itself is providing specific instructions on how to collect the data. And this really helps us coordinate monitoring across multiple sites and volunteers and helps ensure that the data we're collecting is consistent. And then all the data also, because it's part of the app, is automatically uploaded to a database, which makes it readily available for our use and it makes it easier to share the, with the public and hopefully helps to demonstrate the validity of community-based research. So, so far, some things we've noticed. Um, we see that both native and non-native species um, very quickly find our base camps and make them their homes. Um, and depending on where our base camps are located, North Bay, Central Bay, Alameda, Richmond, um, you'll see different assemblages of animals. Um, and because of their size and how quickly they um, get covered in sort of these assortments of animals, uh, they get kind of heavy. So I think moving forward, we're gonna have to do some redesigning to make sure that um, anyone who wants to participate in the base camp program uh, is, can easily handle one of these base camps. And uh, now that we have our first five base camps in the water and we're learning what isn't, isn't working, we can take that feedback and refine the program and hopefully expand it to schools and other community groups and just other public locations. Because right now our five base camps four are some very dedicated volunteers of ours that happen to have private docks and then also one of our restaurants that has waterfront access. So we definitely want to expand the program so that more people um, in more areas can be involved. Um, and then also we would like to put a dashboard once we've started collecting a lot of data on our website that gives people a real-time sense of uh, what's happening with the base camp program. And of course, we would like to see uh, as many Olympia oysters settling in the base camps as great. possible. We are so looking forward to continuing our partnership. Um, it was great to have you at our oyster research station training in the winter, uh, at least part one. Um, and we're, you know, I'm 
always amazed by the West Coast organisms. So just seeing some of those photos <laughs> here and seeing the growth on them always makes me super excited. So thank you so much, Casey, for um, you know talking Turn about this program. Oops. So next we have um, Stephanie Rothenberg and Suzanne Thorpe. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, their project oh. called uh, Tending Australia, Serenades for Settling. No. You guys are muted. Yep. Uh, give us one sec. It's not open. Oh no. It just uh, it just quit out. Do you want someone to go ahead of us while we? Give us one second here. Sure. So I can introduce myself and Before. eat up some of this time. I'm Suzanne Thorpe. Um, I'm an artist researcher whose work intersects electronic music and media, feminist theory, and ecology. And I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University. And I teach and research primarily in the computer music departments. And while Stephanie shares the screen, uh, I'm going to riff here, and she's got it. This is very exciting. Okay. Yay. I hope I shared the sound, though. You're fine. Oh, well, okay. Yes. So, hi, I'm Stephanie Rothenberg, and I'm an artist based in Buffalo, New York. I teach uh, in the Department of Art at the University of Buffalo. And I create interactive artworks that reflect and visualize relationships between human design systems and biological ecosystems. So we're here today because we're creating an immersive sound and media installation that dramatizes the fact that oysters listen and um, it will highlight the probability that aquatic noise can interfere with their life cycle. So we're building off of the research conducted at North Carolina State University's Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences that found that oysters know suitable settlement habitats through a distinction of sound signatures in underwater soundscapes. And we're also working um, with the research from the University or of Bordeaux in France that found that oysters are most sensitive to frequencies that range from 10 to 200 Hertz and close their valves in response to this range. So in the strictest terms, oysters hear water and substrate borne vibrations by sensing the particle component of a sound wave as opposed to the pressure levels that we listen for. Um, they do this through their epidermal cells, their internal statocystic receptor systems and their abdominal sense organ, which is highly sensitive to mechanical waterborne vibrations. And based on this information, we're currently analyzing aquatic noise at oyster restoration sites initiated by the Billion Oyster Project. And here you can see Suzanne with her hydrophone listening to and recording the acoustic ecology at the Bushwick Inlet Field Station that's located in the East River in Brooklyn. This information, along with maritime traffic data, will be woven into a composed soundscape that will be a feature of our multimedia installation. And here you can see a sketch of the installation with a simulated oyster reef in the center that will feature robotic oysters nestled into the reef of real oyster shells. On the walls will be projections of real-time data visualizations from sources such as local marine traffic and weather that impact robotic oysters themselves. Uh, it'll impact their movements along with sound collected from the billion oyster field sites. So these robotic oysters have sound sensors embedded in them so that they can listen to their environment. They will be at different stages of their life cycle and respond according um, to the life cycle they are in. So for example, here we see a mature oyster that opens and closes its shell and expels water. And other robotic oysters might be at an earlier stage of the life cycle, such as the pet of villager and respond to the sound by moving across the reef. The ultimate goal of this project is to raise awareness about acoustic sensitivity in non-human species and oysters in particular to anthropogenic noise. As sound impact on invertebrates is a newer area of research, we anticipate this information can help oyster restoration efforts and improve our ecosystem overall. 
We look forward to sharing this crucial information with the general public with our immersive installation and inspire them to care for oysters well-being this way too. So with that, we'd like to thank the um, everyone at the Billion Oyster Project for their support. Thank you so much. Um, we were out in the field just the other day and putting those headphones on and listening to the environment was absolutely insane. Uh, you know, there's something to be said about what you see in the reef, but then when you hear it, it's just a whole nother experience. It's very, very cool. So thank you guys for coming today. All right, next we have Matt Hare, who's going to be presenting When Oysters Smith Swim. Uh, when Oysters Swim, where do they go? I got it. It's not letting me turn on my video, but maybe I guess I don't need to if I just share a screen. How about now? There you go. There we go. And so hello, everybody. My name is Matt Hare, and um, little did I know when I made this title that uh, Stephanie and Suzanne would already have an answer for us. Uh, um, when oysters swim, where do they go? And apparently they, they go towards uh, reefs. Uh, but I'm interested in this because I'm interested in the connectivity among populations. And I'm a geneticist and I often use um, DNA methods to, to study that question. In, um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> You're familiar with um, uh, oysters like this fellow uh, that was plucked off of a piling in Hudson River Park. Of course, oysters don't swim um, in this life stage, but as we were just hearing, um, the larvae uh, and, a, and a large female like this it can create, can, can spawn tens of millions of eggs in a, in a given reproductive season. Um, so that's many, many billions of larvae in a, um, in a system from, uh, from a living population. And just to remind you of that life history, the, the larvae are in the water developing and feeding for two to three weeks uh, for eastern oysters before they settle and become spat and cement themselves down and never move again. So I've been interested in um, where the larvae go from this remnant uh, breeding population that's up near the Mario Cuomo Bridge. Uh, and so these are data of settlement numbers when putting uh, bags of shell out into the water uh, at different places along the, uh, along the shores. This is a collaboration that I've had with Billion Oyster Project since 2018. Um, they've been covering the Southern area, I've been covering the Northern area. And we put out uh, shell bags synchronously uh, so that we get a snapshot in, in August, September, and October of where there is settlement. And you can see that there's um, the greatest amount of settlement up near the breeders, uh, but, and then a, um, a dissipating amount of settlement south of there. And so just to show you some of the data from that, uh, this is settlement uh, measured in terms of number of spat per day on average in Irvington. So that's the furthest up um, towards the breeding population. And I'm also showing in the blue line, the salinity profile. Typically it's um, lower salinity below 10 in the spring up near Irvington, and then up into moderate salinities a little above 10. And, uh, and so we've got several years data. Um, I feel it's very important to understand the interannual variation in uh, in the uh, larval abundance and larval settlement. And so here you can see uh, pretty similar salinity profiles in these three years. We had a, a, a boom year um, in terms of um, the spat that were found in Irvington in 2020. And then in 2021, uh, I wanted to highlight the fact that salinity barely ever got above 10 throughout the summer. And we saw very little settlement um, in Irvington for comparison uh, in 2021. So um, as climate change um, increases the amount of um, storms and uh, precipitation, we can anticipate uh, salinity being um, at least episodically low and challenging uh, that, that breeding population. Uh, so, uh, so here's, um, again, comparative data giving you more of a sense of the spatial 
arrangement. Uh, this is again um, a histogram plotting the uh, the axis here is number of spat per day uh, up near the breeding population down near Hudson River Park. And I want to spend the rest of the time I have, which is not much, um, just talking about Hudson River Park and the, uh, the restoration installation they put in, in the fall of last year. And I'm working with Kerry Robel and, and Siddhartha Hayes uh, to think about um, uh, now that they've got 1,500 adult oysters in Hudson River Park, where are their larvae going to go? And I'm working um, in a project with Sean Kramer, several others, Billion Oyster Project is, is involved. Uh, and Sean is the mathematical and, and modeling wizard. And he was kind enough to, uh, to model uh, using his biophysical model where larvae might be predicted to go from um, if they depart from Hudson River Park. And so here you're seeing the sloshing back and forth of the tide. Uh, what he does is he's actually uh, modeling larval behavior as well as the physics of the hydrodynamics and the tidal flow and the wind forcing. And, um, and so uh, he lets this go for um, uh, 21 to 28 days in order until he gets um, a final result like this. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and so this is, uh, this is not a final result. I just wanted to show you the kinds of approaches we're using to try to understand where the library are going because it's the connectivity that we can have among restoration reefs, among populations that is gonna um, provide for sustainability. And finally, I just wanna thank a whole bunch of people, uh, funding agencies, collaborators, and the, the uh, wonderful, generous folks that are hosting some of our um, equipment on the shore. Yeah. And Ben Livingston and Steve Fleming of the BioBoat who have helped with uh, those deployments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for this presentation. That animation um, was really, really cool to just watch the oysters kind of um, where they might be. So we're gonna hear from Sean a little bit later. He's presenter number nine. We have about four more presentations. Um, so the next one is going to be um, from Jenny Marktu rivering uh, and uh, wet gatherings. Okay, uh, hello, I'm um, uh, Jenny Marchetto. I will, I, I, I will start reading my presentation and then I will show you the, the images. Um, so my, uh, I'm a, 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 a transmedia artist and also professor of new media and public engagement at the new school. My practice employs public art, lens-based practices, emerging technologies, and community engagement to confront the relationship between humans and environment um, with focus on water and marine ecosystems, histories, traditions, knowledges, philosophies. Rivering wet gatherings is a performative water bound installation and research project, which I conceived and I realized in close collaboration with young students from the New York Harbor School. Uh, so let me start with, okay. So can you see that? Yes. So with, uh, with a, a Harbor School uh, and Robert Buchanan Education Community Engagement and Billion Oyster Project and Aaron Sign, Waterfront Director at the Harbor School. Um, it began last summer during my research as an artist in residence at Swell Lab at Governors Island, where I became familiar with the Oyster Project. And also depends my connection between my photography series, which I did back in the 90s as a young MFA student at Pratt, when I came to Governors Island and photographed the Coast Guard facility, when then they, they were na uh, navigation, they were uh, building navigational markers, uh, painted and repaired. For this project, I have collaborated with these young students. Um, uh, 
which we were involved in the design, construction, and installation to build a series of life-size colorful reimagined buoys known as navigational markers made out of found material from the island. During the first phase, which I, that's all I, can, I will be able to, to show you today of the project, the buoys that we are, we, are make, we are building are mounted with cameras to record the motion. They will be, they will be uh, put into the water and they will uh, record the motion, the sounds, water quality and activity on the waterways starting from Pier 102 and eventually going to Buttermilk channel. Um, uh, so what is the goal, to, as I say, to capture the tides as well the textures, qualities of colors, modes, particles suspending, and the hundred species and make, that make their habitat in the waterways of Governor's Island. The visual and sound material captured from the floating mapping will be comp a component of a film. The aim of this artwork, which is closely connected with the nautical and water history of Governors Island, establishes a poetic relationship between the waterways, the water species, and the land of Governors Island, as well as it aims in making speculative tools for other ways of seeing and listening the waterways and the rivers while exposing the importance of accessibility to water. That for us has been, as, as we have been discussing with the students, one of the main components. How come we live in Manhattan? How come we, we are surrounded by water, but there is no accessibility? Um, uh, what does clean water mean in an urban context? And how does enable us to, to imagine another future for waterways of New York and Governors Island. So as a public art project, it, pro it pro is produced and designed to engage new forms of community, understanding water as a space for coming together and enables young students to co-create activities open to all publics who visit the island. So I will take you fast through some images because at this phase of the project, all I can share with you is the first uh, phase, which has been the building. Here is where I'm sharing with my students the photographs that I took almost 20 years ago. Um, so here, here our, our studio is the boat studio. Uh, here is the first ideas for uh, this reimagining buoys. Um, here I'm taking you through. So we, we start using different material and the different two, uh, uh, as I said, everything that we found on the island. Um, the, the, the group of students that they have been collaborating with me varies between 12 and 15. Uh, we try actually to build the buoys while at the same time we were building the, the boat. Yeah, that, that boat came out beautiful too. So yes. we're... And what it is very beautiful is we try connecting how can, we can use the boat along with the, the two, the, yeah. these new tools that we are creating. We're looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, how the project progresses and yes. hopefully those and, and, school students will be able to help us with the installation as well. Right. And here is, you know, I'm, I'm start, I, I would like to, to show you how we have been working um, all together. And as I say, what was have been very important is we creating, we created a very, very close community. Um, and as you see, all we had all kinds of participation yeah and fun thank you. Thank what you so i enjoyed much. very much was the fun the energy that we all shared through the, these workshops and looking forward into how we can create new tools or or here here is our second phase when we are painting 
the 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 buoys, these imaginary buoys, um, and actually attaching to them different objects like uh, uh, that, that we have uh, we found on the island. Here is when we are writing the name of on on the boat, which is the uh, a name Mooning, which is this um, uh, mythological bird. Yeah, she sends out messages and brings. Uh, I'm so sorry. We're gonna have to wrap up to get to the next presenter. Okay. But do you so have here a is the, 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 the first phase? That's where we, in a couple of weeks, we are going to put the 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 buoys and the cameras into this part of the island, and then the the material that we collect, we will move uh, to, to Buttermilk Channel. And hopefully by the end of summer, I will be, be able to share with the public, the film, uh, some of the data that we have collected yeah. and uh, it, it start a series uh, of talks and discussion with the public to, oh, uh, um, with the title Wet Gatherings. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, for those of you who want to learn more, Jenny can pop her website or even come to the networking event to chat with you further. So yeah. without further ado, uh, I'm going to transition to John Michael Garbalato. Um, he is going to be presenting on human environmental interactions on the Hudson River estuary, Sheldman's uh, new realizations at Dogen Point. I don't think I can screen share quite, oh, there we go. Go for it right now, <laughs> you should be able to. All right. Greetings. For the last few years, I have been traveling throughout the Hudson Valley, giving guest lectures and presentations about the cultural and archaeological significance of Hudson River estuary shell middens. I'm using a historical ecological perspective to better understand the development of pre-European indigenous relationships with this important ecosystem and how they may have been impacted by cultural and environmental shifts throughout various periods of time. Shelmiddens are the focus of my research and are cultural spaces located on the mainland, islands, and estuaries of New York and similar landscapes in North America. The Shelmiddens I am studying were created by the Algonquin speaking peoples of this region and their ancestors. Dogen Point is the main archaeological site I have been studying because it is one of the largest and most important Shelmidden sites along the Hudson River estuary. Dogen Point is located in Westchester County in Montrose, New York, and represents some of the earliest and most intense evidence for shell fishing in the region to date. However, many of the previous projects that have seen were only cursory, used outdated methods, or the cultural and ecological data collected were fully documented. With pre what previous projects at Dogen Point did demonstrate was that by at least 7,000 years ago, indigenous peoples were relying on resources from this ecosystem. In particular, oysters were increasingly important from 8,000 to 5,000 years ago and during later periods. They were also a resource that supplemented European economic interest in the region throughout much of the colonial period. The study of shamanins are important because their contents can help us assess various cultural and environmental changes and variations in subsistence technology and human environment relations. I like to think of shelmiddens as time capsules. The shells, faunal, and botanical remains and artifacts that archaeologists recover can be analyzed to define important aspects of human environment relations and assess when and why changes, if any, took place. The broader implications of my research are important. Successfully dating a large sample size of organic specimens and defining the size and extent of Dogen Point will help improve the chronology and our understanding of occupation here. And when paired with artifacts will help refine regional typologies used by many archeologists. The data collected and used from this project will help identify a history of potential human and environmental impact on estuary and species. This research could also lead to improved relations with indigenous peoples, indigenous communities that could benefit future research projects in the region. This goal is really important to me because it was something that previous archeologists overlooked or avoided. Results could also improve and provide important data for management of this complex and important ecosystem by providing various baselines that could be used in policymaking and conservation efforts. For example, results could be particularly useful for programs focused on shellfish restoration, public outreach, and education. Finally, my research may bring more attention to the study of shell middens along the Hudson River estuary and demonstrate their significance and importance 
for advancing our knowledge of, of human environment relations. Now, what I'd like to show you, and I'll walk you through this, is sort of my working uh, regional map of human environmental interaction from seven or 8,000 years ago all the way to today with what the work the Billion Oyster Project is doing. These yellow circles represent uh, current, I need to update it, but these are the most current data I have on Billion Oyster Project reef stations. These purple faces represent 19th century uh, commercial fishing grounds. And this is where we really see the dramatic reduction in oyster populations globally, especially in this part of the Northeast. These white stars represent archeological sites going back from the late woodland period um, around 1000 years ago to as far back as the middle to early archaic period, which is around 8,000 years ago. So as you can see, they go pretty far north. And then these orange circles you see are my main study areas. The northernmost reach of my study area is in, is in Tivoli Bays at a freshwater uh, shell midden site. And then we have Dogen Point, which is uh, the bottom circle. Then you have these other X's. These represent uh, research that was done by Mark Harrington through the uh, Museum of Natural History in the uh, 1900s. So as you can see, a lot of activity, human environmental interaction throughout this part of the Hudson River, um, one of the most important and significant estuaries in the Northeast and in North America and globally for that matter. Um, if you'd like to contact me, here's my email. You can also follow my work at, on Instagram at Hudson River Archaeology. Thank you to the Billion Oyster Project for inviting me to this discussion um, and presentation event. I look forward to coming back for more and thank you to all panelists. Thank you so much, John. It's great to see you again. Yeah, We've been working together for so long now, so it's great to see how your work is progressing. Pre-pandemic time. Yeah. All right. So next we have Sean Kramer, um, um, who's going to be showing a website for dissemination of ecosystem um, model results based on potential site restoration in New York Harbor. All right. There we go. Okay, well, well, thanks. A warm welcome to the Billion Oyster Project for hosting this and providing the opportunity to show our work a bit. So I'm a mathematician based in central Vermont at Norwich University. And about two years ago, we embarked on a project to provide highly realistic hypothetical restoration simulations in the Harbor region. We were provided incredibly high resolution three-dimensional vector fields for the water movement in the entire Harbor and we saw a great opportunity to build more realistic simulations. So we partnered with the VOP in hopes of providing high quality simulations to explain potential benefits of these restoration scenarios, either already in progress or proposed. Um, we also aim to provide educational outreach in order to demonstrate the potential benefits of different restoration scenarios to the students. Um, <clears throat> So all of this work has been realized in the form of our webpage, which is oysterecosystemmodels.com, all one word. Um, that's what we chose, and you can see it here. And um, it is completely finished and live. There's, it's a work in progress, of course, but you can explore now. Um, and, and we expect to make changes as we gain feedback. But we have two components I was going to show. Uh, there's a filtration component here. Um, which models the filtration of waters by hypothetical oyster colonies if placed in different regions. So I'm looking at the Jamaica Bay here, and uh, we've got five regions, the Hudson area, the Raritan, the Upper and Lower Bay, and the East River. And in this model, you instantiate synthetic pollutants uniformly in the domain, and we use uh, the provided water currents to move the pollutants around in time. And as they pass over a colony, they are filtered according to observed rates, in situ observed rates. And uh, particles which spend quite a bit of time over the colony will be nearly completely filtered. So the more such particles, you know, the, the more you'll see uh, pollutants filtered away. So for a colony placed here, you click on this and you'll see 21% ah, of the total volume of the water in the Jamaica Bay was, was filtered over a residence time, uh, as opposed to over here, 32% of the, of the water so, and you can, you can see where the original colony was and you can look at the uh, volume filtered over time here. And so it's just a, a way to explore 
um, different hypothetical scenarios. And the other uh, component here is the transport, which uh, Matt Hare talked about briefly. And so if you go to our transport page, we have several different uh, subdomains like the Hart Hudson River, and I chose the Hudson here to look at specifically, but also the East River, the Upper uh, Bay and uh, Raritan Bay and, and so on. And when you click on the there, um, you can, so let's say we'd like to throw a colony here and 23% of the larvae released from this colony would remain in the Hudson River and settle and 77% wouldn't. And so each one of these comes with its own movie that you can kind of track. Uh, let me start at the beginning here. So if you release the larvae, that's what happens. Uh, there are four releases for, for these scenarios um, and they run for about 21 days before they become competent to settle. And as they become old enough to settle, they turn red if, and uh, will settle in this movie if they are close enough to the seafloor. And they swim vertically based on encountering salinity gradients and age and other uh, specific factors. Um, and so that's a way you can sort of explore and see, hey, if we restore colonies in these regions, um, where might we see the most uh, attenuation where the, the larvae might settle um, in, in their river. So it's pretty, pretty neat uh, to explore around and see um, how these proposed restoration scenarios would play out. Um, and then lastly, we have an educational page here and that's this one. So um, it's a nice work in progress as well. Um, but we aim to integrate this into the uh, BOP public school outreach curriculum. Um, where one can learn about mechanics behind out, how oysters actually filter water and why restoration is so vital to restoring and maintaining the water quality, among other things. Uh, and down here, there's a great movie made by Dr. Gray um, at uh, Maryland, uh, which visually explores the me mechanistic um, filtration process. So this was a very quick overview. I invite you to explore the website if you're interested and thank you for your time. This, this work I should mention has been funded by the New York Sea Grant. And I work with Matt Hare and Matt Gray. And uh, at the BOP, uh, we work with Anne Fraioli and Christian Schreiber quite a bit. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I love this graphic, you know, the like animation of where the larva will settle. I have a feeling that I'm going to be like looking at this just before I get out into the field <laughs> on my Thanks. next field days. Very cool. Thanks. Um, so next up, we have Nick, uh, Nicholas Ring, um, who is going to be presenting about examining temporal trends of alewives downstream migrations through a fishway. Sean, you can stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Um. Why isn't it letting me? There we go. Right. right. I'd like to go ahead and thank the Billion Oaks Project for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, my name is Nicholas Ring, and I'm a current intern with the Billion Oyster Project. However, not so long ago, I was working with uh, the Peconic Estuary Program, or partnership, I should say, uh, working on alewife migrations in the Peconic Estuary, which, for those who don't know, is all the way on the west end of Long Island, right between those forks. Right. Uh, there we go. So uh, currently the Conic Estuary Partnership is working on alewife migrations. They are an androgynous species, meaning that they uh, migrate upstream to spawn and then migrate back downstream back into the Atlantic Ocean where they live the majority of their lives. Uh, for the past three years, the Conic Estuary Partnership has been monitoring uh, the Gingbell Fishway uh, right uh, at the mouth of the Peconic River. Um, it is tip, uh, it, we analyze it by subsampling uh, 24 hours worth of videos. And that subsampling method is designed for us to best uh, view the entire uh, alewife run moving upstream as alewife moving upstream are alewife that will spawn and hopefully uh, continue their life cycle. And the, however, uh, what we do not know is how effective that uh, subsampling is on counting downstream movement. Uh, but And so we chose to study that downstream movement, A, to figure out how accurate our data is for downstream movement, but also to see if we can relate downstream movement 
to mortality as if alewife uh, do not make it downstream that means that they unfortunately passed in uh, while upstream in their lakes during spawning and can no longer continue that cycle so what we did is we took uh, five different days from the 2020 and 2020 alewife uh, migration and uh, subsampled uh, that full 24 hour uh, day into uh, moving upstream, uh, moving downstream, or turnaround, which is a conglomeration of uh, moving of fall up and fall back. Uh, we also uh, decided to compare them to uh, the temporal uh, aspects of so day, night, and twilight, because we know that alewives typically migrate upstream and in general at night. So if we found that if general migration of downstream occurred at night, that means that chances are it is accurate. However, what we ended up finding was quite interesting. In the 2020 run, uh, it was a little, uh, we only had data from March. And as you can see, uh, uh, you cannot see a mouse, but as you can see in the right-hand side, uh, we is all of our data divided up by month. Uh, March has the highest concentration of upstream movement, which makes sense because it is the first month in the uh, of their migration, which is from March to May. Um, and because of that, the 2020 run, when compared to the entire subsampled run, is a is a inaccurate. However, for the 2021 run, where we had three days from March, April, and May, it is much more comparable. Uh, we also saw that our uh, uh, movement downstream uh, mostly occurred at night in compare, uh, which was very similar to our general movement during uh, the day. So uh, that's very good that we do have our accurate data there. Um, however, we did uh, uh, we did note that I believe about uh, the However, you can also see that there is a very wide discrepancy in uh, movement upstream and downstream. Uh, and when combined with our uh, pre with our previous study showing that about 30% of alewives that migrate upstream end up migrating downstream uh, through a different method, we found that we have about a 54% mortality rate while upstream. Uh, this compared to a study in the 70s in New England of uh, a mortality rate of about 30 to 40%, we know that something is very, very wrong here. Uh, and what we found, and what might be going on here, is that there is a lot of alewife migrating into a very limited habitat, as this fishway leads into a small lake that is currently dammed uh, without a fishway. So this shallow water could lead to several problems, including uh, high predation rates from various uh, uh, predators, such as ospreys, who are now returning to uh, Long Island, but also from starvation, as this very limited habitat. Uh, will limit their access to food. All right. So in the but in the future it is important that we kind of monitor how the alewife are uh, passing while upstream. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, thank you. All right. Um, great. Thank you so much, Nick, for that presentation. Thank you, everyone who's presented. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience, for joining us at our second annual symposium, Symposium. The symposium is tomorrow, and I hope to see everyone at our Symposium networking event taking place after the symposium at 3 o'clock. Um, the first round is on us. So you'll come out, learn more about the projects, what everyone is doing, and have a chat. Um, thanks once again to the team, Helene, Joe, Agata for producing, Tunisia for moderating. Thank you all and have a good night.